Welcome to chapel this morning. Welcome to chapel. It's a delight to see you. If you can direct your attention here, I want to let you know this morning before we get started that today's chapel, I sent you a text message in the last hour, and that text message says that today's chapel is going to last until 1145. Now, I need you to be aware that if you were to scan out prior to 1145, we will not be able to give you credit for today's chapel. So please, please stay seated until the very end of our time together. Your professors have been notified. They are aware that you may be late to class. We also have pizza for you after chapel, if that helps save some time. <laughs> I need you to do me one more favor. With the weather, some of, your co some of your peers are going to be coming in late. Will you please convey to them what I have just told you, that chapel's going to go a bit long and to not get up at 1130 and try to leave this space. Please stay until the very end. I know that you will be an attentive and phenomenal audience today because that's what I know of you as ACU students. You are fantastic students, and so I expect nothing less from you. So thank you for that. Our guest today is Dr. Christopher Yuan. He's a sought-after author of the book Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. That book, in fact, was named the 2020 Book of the Year for Social Issues by Outreach Magazine. Dr. Yuan graduated from Moody Bible Institute. Many of you may be aware of that uh, institution in Chicago. He holds a master's degree in biblical exegesis. He holds a doctorate of ministry degree. He taught the Bible at Moody Bible Institute for 12 years. And his speaking ministry on faith and sexuality has reached five continents. Today, it reaches West Texas. And so we're delighted. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Yuan to the stage this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for every good and perfect gift. Lord, we praise you that you are the author of life. Lord, help us by your grace to be more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. For God so loved the world. Many of you know that verse. We know what it says. But one thing that's interesting is we don't often reflect on what that verse does not say. The verse does not say, for God only loves Christians. For God so loved the world. The verse also doesn't say, for God only loves those who only obey him and are really, really, really good people. For God so loved the world. We also need to note that the verse does not say, for God only loves those who have opposite sex attractions. For God so loved the world. The question we need to ask ourselves then is, how does God love? Love is love, the world says. And I thought we were accused of circular reasoning. You do you. Is that how God loves? Or does God love in this way? Romans 5, verse 8, where Paul writes, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Still sinners. You know that word in Greek that we translate in still, you know what that means? Still. Amazing. Still sinners, not getting your life together. No, still sinners. And then a few verses later, it says that God loves us while we were enemies. Who does that? God does. 
and he's calling us to love in that same way. So though the world will accuse you or accuse me or accuse us of being narrow-minded in our understanding of love, actually that's not true. The world does, as if there's no love outside of marriage. Mon love does marriage does not have a monopoly on love. Christians who hold to biblical sexuality actually have the most broad, liberal, if you will, understanding of love that we even love enemies. The world doesn't do that. God does. And he's calling you to love in that same way. And some of you might be wondering, I mean, why in the world did this school invite someone like me to speak on this really, really non-controversial topic? Well, it's not something that's just an academic exercise for me. It's something that's very real. I was not raised in a Christian home, but my parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values. Obey your parents, do well in school, and practice piano. <laughs> I had this secret, though, that I kept hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet. I began living openly as a gay man in the gay community. I spent most of my free time, and so I decided to go home, break the news to my parents, and I told them, I am gay. Devastated my mom and dad, who were not a Christian, but amazingly, through that crisis, my mother came to faith, and then my father did as well. When I went in the total opposite direction, one had nothing to do with their crazy religion. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs. I went from relationship to relationship seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found temporarily, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. And I need to be really, really clear. Sometimes people think that I'm saying all gay men do drugs. I'm not. I'm just telling my story. And hopefully I'll be able to tell my story and that voice that isn't unheard. Oftentimes we're, you know, people like, oh, we want to hear voices that are not heard. Totally true. You can hear all the voices that's affirming of gay relationships in the world. Voices like mine are suppressed. So I praise the Lord that this school is allowing me to have that voice to tell you about Jesus. So I, um, I, I unfortunately was experimenting with drugs. But for those of you that don't know, drugs do cost money. So I supported my habit by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was receiving my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago, where I was living at that time, to Louisville, where I was going to dental school. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My dad was a dentist. He knew the dean very well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit. And I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate besides. Isn't that what any good Chinese parents would do anyway? To my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mom told the dean, it is not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And she said they're going to support whatever decision the school made. My mother knew that when it comes to her children, nothing is more important than her children following Jesus. But I got to be honest with you, I was not happy about my mom's decision. She wasn't on my side, I felt. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago, to the bright lights in big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community, and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no clue that I was doing drugs. But they knew that my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So they tried to reach out to me love of Christ. And I wanted nothing to do with it. They came to visit me one time in Atlanta. And I told them to get out. And here's the interesting thing. We hear the narrative today that Christian parents who actually believe in the Bible cannot, are unable to love their gay child. They actually have to get rid of this or kind of twist it or kind of say, oh, there's so many different interpretations to love their gay child. I hear that the exact opposite experience. My parents were not Christian 
they rejected me. It wasn't until they became followers of Christ they could do, they knew they could do nothing other than love me as God loved them while they were still sinners, while they were even enemies. So they came, I kicked them out. Before my dad left, he gave me his Bible. And I told, told my dad, I don't want your Bible. He left it on my kitchen counter, walked out the door, and as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in the trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God and certainly nothing to do with the Bible. And it was obvious to my parents that I was hopeless. And my parents committed not to focus upon hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over a hundred prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would spend hours every morning in her prayer closet, on her knees, reading the Bible, crying out to God, interceding for me, for many, many others. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the Father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door, on my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in Atlanta City Detention Center. So I tried calling home, dreading making that phone call, just imagining the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But my mother's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice how Paul isn't saying that it's God's anger, not God's wrath, but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my Mom was excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not, because I hadn't called home in years, and she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears. She knew she had to do like that good old hymn says, count your blessings, name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through. No matter what heartache she was enduring, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down next to the phone was a calculator. She tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And when I got out of prison, this list of blessings was longer and taller than she is, both sides. Three days later, I was walking on the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My dad had two doctors. I was just three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, 
and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire gospel of Mark that night. But let me tell you, I wasn't thinking this is the word of God, and I certainly wasn't thinking this is the answer. I just thought that I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and a better passage somehow. But if some of you know what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have in our Bibles is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pretty sight. And I thought things were going to get worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. She sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. So she wrote something on a piece of paper, slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read... H-I-V positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, better than ten years to life, but news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed, and I look up at the cold metal bunk above me, and somebody had scribbled something. And it read, if you're bored... Read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. At the most hopeless point in my life, God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Judah, to tell me that if God could have a plan for Judah in exile, in rebellion, he could even still have a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me, but he gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my idols, obviously drugs. Within a few months, he completely delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols. And there was just this one thing that I felt like I just couldn't let go of. My sexuality. So I went to a chaplain and I asked him his opinion. Remember, I'm a brand new Christian. I know very little about the Bible. And I thought, I got to ask someone who knows the Bible, study the Bible, gone to cemetery seminary the chaplain and to my surprise this chaplain actually told me the bible does not condemn homosexuality and he even gave me a book explaining that view so think about it with much curiosity i took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for same-sex relationships i had that book in one hand and the bible in the other can i just tell you From a human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, His Word, and the Gospel. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I thought, okay, let's just set aside these six passages, which we can't, but let's just, for argument's sake, let's just, I'll I'll just look at all the other. I mean, there's tons and tons of other. I was like, let's see if there's any passage that might actually be positive toward be a blessing that would actually bless a monogamous same sex relationship. I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked and I looked and I looked. And I couldn't find any. So I was at a crossroads, a turning point. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same sex relationship, By allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. 
or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? By freeing myself from my sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I am and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality doesn't have to be, actually shouldn't be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally. That's true. But we often like to add to God's truth. I added, so therefore God doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who might say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Can I say it again? Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy, for I am holy. You know, I used to think before I become a Christian that to become a Christian, I had to become a heterosexual. What does that mean? I need to be sexually attracted to the opposite sex. As a matter of fact, I was under the false impression the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if a man had opposite sex attraction, he would still need to flee temptation and resist sin. So heterosexuality might be the right direction, it's just not the right goal. Because think about this, God never commands us, be heterosexual, for I am heterosexual. But neither did God ever say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. They're both the wrong secular Freudian categories. They are both the wrong secular Freudian categories. And if we're more busy chasing after Freud than Jesus, that's problematic. So the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That is not the right goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted. Jesus Christ himself was tempted in every way, but he's without sin. So change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptation. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life. And he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my call to ministry would remain the same regardless of the location. With that change of heart, God did another miracle. And he shortened my prison sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that if I was going to continue on in ministry, I'd better learn more about the Bible. So I called home, collected my parents, told them I think God's calling me into ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the line because I think they both dropped their phones. <laughs> they mailed the application into me to prison. I filled it out until I realized I needed references. Remember those? Well, these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickers in prison. But I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another inmate to write my references to Moody. So amazingly, I was accepted. I was released from prison in July of 2001. Started the very next month in August of 2001. So uh, imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> I graduated from Moody 2005. I went on to my master's in exegesis in 2007, received my doctorate of ministry in 2014, and then back in 2011, I had the wonderful privilege of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. We wrote this together. She wrote chapter one. I wrote chapter two. She, she wrote all the odd chapters. I wrote the even chapters because we wanted to just tell you from our own voice how you can have the same situation 
told from two totally pers different perspectives. And we found out that actually this book has been used in Christian school classrooms. So who would have thought that our testimony is now being used as a textbook? I also introduced this concept of holy sexuality in the back of our memoir in the last few chapters, and I knew I needed to flesh that out. So I wrote my newer book called Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, Sex, Design, Relationship Shaped by God's Grand Story, which goes beyond what you often hear when it comes to sexuality. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. That's important. But we can't stop there. Because you can't build a Christian life just on God's no. What is God's yes? Well, it's holy sexuality. Chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And that is good news for all. And I'll be talking about that uh, more tonight. There's also um, a huge need for us to have resources for teenagers. So some of you might have some siblings that are still at home in high school. There's so few resources. And um, so for the past three years, I've been adapting my book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, into a video series. And now it was just released a few months ago. It's called The Holy Sexuality Project. It's a 12 lesson, 36 videos, 270 minutes of content, 90 minutes of which are animation. You guys familiar with the Bible Project? Well, we were able to get many of those illustrators, animators, sound engineers to actually work on, the, on the, our project. Uh, it was actually a $1.2 million project um, that was able to, you know, we actually, we've had donors that have covered that. Um, and it's, it, it, you know, many of these projects like this video series are like in, in the hundreds of dollars. And it's just 20 because we want every family, grandparents, single mothers to be able to have this, to have these conversations at home. At the beginning of my book and the beginning of this, various, uh, this series, I begin on something that I believe is probably the most important thing that I see missed by Christians today. What I believe is the most important thing that we don't get when it comes to understanding sexuality and engaging with those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, etc., it's how we have conflated sexuality with who we are. That we have conflated self-perception, gender, gender with who we are. I mean, that's an important question. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? How we all answer this question has huge consequences. Mother, uh, for some, self-identity is shaped by family, friends, or culture. Others put their identity in work. I'm a lawyer. Or maybe sports. I'm a football player. Or in a hobby. I'm a gamer. Still others put their identity solely in their sexuality. I am gay or in their self-perception. I am trans. But do these substitutes actually describe who we are? Or does it describe something else? And you might think, well, what's the big deal? You say tomato, I say tomato. Someone might say gay. Someone else might say I am same such attracted. What's the difference? Aren't we just quibbling over words? No. Words matter. The words that we use to describe ourselves that point to our essence, it impacts how we think. It impacts the choices we make. It impacts the relationships that we build. Our thoughts, our choices, our relationships are shaped in large part by how we all answer this question, who am I? Suggesting this close relationship between essence and ethics. What do I mean? Who we are, essence, impacts how we live, ethics, and vice versa is true. How we live, ethics, impacts who we are, ethics. So if we have a flawed view of who we are, you're going to have a flawed personal ethic, and vice versa is true. If you have a flawed personal ethic, you're going to have a flawed view of who you are. 
So if a person says, I'm a partier, is that going to impact how he lives? Of course it is. How about a person says, I'm a lawyer? Will that influence what she thinks about? She's going to think a lot about law. How about if a person says, I'm a football player? Is that going to impact the choices he makes? He's going to choose to watch, play, practice what? Football. How about a person says, I'm a gamer? Is that going to impact the relationship she builds? Most of her friends will be gamers. See, our thoughts, our actions are, are shaped in large part. Personhood affects practice. Practice affects personhood. When I identified as a gay man, my whole world was gay. That affected my thoughts, my choices, my relationships. As a matter of fact, all my friends were gay men. There's this misperception, it's a myth, that there's a such thing as a LGBTQ plus community. There's, there's communities, plural. They're, they're not one monolithic group. All my friends were gay men, not even lesbians. I had some friends that were lesbians, but the majority. I lived in an apartment complex in Midtown Atlanta that was 90% gay men. I worked out at a gay gym. I bought my groceries at what we nicknamed the Gay Kroger. I bought, bought, bought my new sports car at the gay car dealership. My bookkeeper was gay. My housekeeper was gay. Everything and everyone around me affirmed what my flesh was saying. I am gay. And it was the core of who I am. You see, this is much more preliminary than talking to someone that this is sinful behavior. See, that's what I'm talking about. We miss. And we often think, well, how can I t talk to them that this is sinful behavior? How can we discuss with someone that this is sinful behavior when they don't even view it as behavior? Let me say it again. How can we talk to someone that this is sinful behavior if they don't even view it as behavior? Even the term that we put before gay, what, what is that verb? We say being gay. Not doing or feeling, which honestly, that's more accurately just describes sexuality, but being. What does being refer to? Who? we are, our essence, our personhood. See, when we make that error and make being gay who we are, that reveals this deep philosophical, theological misunderstanding. It's a faulty presupposition that points to the core of our being. Being gay no longer means what I'm attracted to, what I desire, what I do. That's what it is, but it no longer means that. It has completely become who a person is. Let's just go back in time, like 20 years ago, when I, when I was not a Christian and I identified as a gay man. And, and let's just say you were to tell me this is sin. I wouldn't hear you say what I'm doing is sin. I wouldn't hear you say that my desires are sinful. No, I would hear you say that my whole person from head to toe is reprehensible to you and to God. See, before I knew Christ, I could not hate my sin without hating myself. Now that I know Christ, I can hate my sin without hating myself. See, that's the important distinction. When you hear all these differing voices, alternative voices, that's the issue. Are we able to hate our sin without hating Ourself. In the conversation around sexuality, this subtle shift from what to who, meaning what we're attracted to, to who we are, has created this radically distorted view of personhood. But if we're honest, I don't know of any other, any other feeling or experience that we've made it who we are. Let's, let's say happiness. If someone were to say, I am happy, would we ever think, oh, that's who you are? No. Unless you're a dwarf and you hang out with six other dwarfs and Snow White. But besides that, you would not be. You would think, well, that's, you know, if someone says, I'm happy, you'd be great. That's, that's how you feel now. Good. So let's go to the other side of the spectrum. Someone might say, I am depressed. 
in a room like this at the school, there are people who struggle with depression. Should we ever say, that is who you are? Yes or no? No. Never. And yet, let's follow this logic. Because I hear people who identify as gay or lesbian or bi, etc., they will say, well, I didn't choose this. So it's who I am. People who struggle with depression, did they choose their depression? Y yes or no? Yes or no? No. So it's who they are. I, I even know people who identify as gay or raised in the church. I, I hear them often say, well, I prayed and prayed and prayed for God to take it away. And he didn't. So God wants me to embrace it. I have really close friends that struggle with depression, de sometimes debilitating, and they prayed and prayed and prayed for God to take it away. Can he? Absolutely. Does he always? No. So you just need to embrace it. That's who you are. See how the logic is wrong? I had this for as long as I remember. I know people who struggle with depression for as long as they remember. It is not who they are. Doesn't matter if you never chose it. Doesn't matter if you prayed and prayed for God to take it away. Doesn't matter if you've had it for as long as you remember. It is not who you are. So let's go to maybe behavior, an action, a sin, sinful behavior. Let's say if someone, you, you might know someone, you know, who gossips all the time. I, I, I know that's not here at Abilene. Um, you know, maybe another school. So like, you're a gossiper. Would we ever think that's who you are? <laughs> no. But what you do. So stop it. How about a person who lies? You're a liar, an adulteress. You're an adulteress. Is that who that person is or what she does? And yet when it comes to gay and we even put the being gay, we have turned it completely into who a person is. So if it's not who we are, then what is it? See, sexuality is not who we are, but how we are and how we feel. It's not who we are, but how we feel. The term heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, it turns desire into personhood, experience into essence. As a matter of fact, the term heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual should not describe people. I know that that might be a huge paradigm shift for you. The term heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual do not describe people. They describe our desires. Unchosen desires, enduring desires. Is a desire a person? Help me out here. Is, it, is a desire a person? But the world has made a desire a person. Our experience, what we feel, what we think, is essentially God. And everything else needs to bow down before it. So no longer are we sola scriptura, scripture alone. Today we are sola experientia, experience alone. So who am I? Who are you? Who are we? And how does that impact how we share the gospel and minister alongside with people who might experience same-sex attraction? Well, for us to properly understand human sexuality, we need to understand humans. How do we understand humans? Begin with God. To understand human sexuality, we need to begin with theological anthropology. And I know it's early, this is before lunch, and so I'm throwing out some big words here, but, but this is college. Theological anthropology, quite simple. We're creating God's image, but we're also all fallen. We're creating God's image. You guys, you guys following me, tracking here? You're texting what, what I'm saying? Cool. Um, so, um, so we cannot properly understand human sexuality unless we begin with theological anthropology. What is theological anthropology? We're creating God's image, but we're also, we're all fallen. All of us, all of humanity. And how does that help us understand our gay friend, our lesbian neighbor? Well, four things. Beginning with theological anthropology, that we're creating God's image, but we're also all fallen, it helps to rebuke the arrogant condemner. 
you might know that that person that that so-called christian that looks down their nose at those gay people they're ruining our country no sin is ruining our country our battle is not against flesh and blood amen there's no one in the world that is our enemy and even if they are what does the bible say that how should we treat our enemies love our enemies so regardless of anyone's age sex or ethnicity regardless of whether someone in submission to god or not regardless whether they have same sex attractions opposite sex attractions both or neither we all are created in the image of god so when we fight for people's dignity and we fight for the marginalized it is not because of our commitment to social justice that's human effort it's because we're all created in the image of god actually the imago dei is the only true foundation for justice second beginning with theological anthropology that we're creating god's image but we're also all fallen it actually it avoids a common incorrect diagnosis and what do i mean some of you might have heard something like this before that the root causes of homosexuality are an absentee father dominant mother or trauma or abuse in one's childhood see that's the wrong diagnosis now if you were abused as a child is that going to impact you as an adult of course it is i don't argue with that that's an influence but an influence is not a cause an influence is not a cause because for us to blame our sin of today on our past in our childhood that's not biblical that's from the teachings of sigmund freud freud is the one that believed that everything that we struggle with as, as an adult is rooted in our childhood that's freud not scripture and let's not chase after freud and chase after jesus so if that's not the root cause then what is i mean what does the bible teach what's the root cause of all of our sin struggles our parents no the root cause of our sin is that every one of us were all fallen every one of us why is that important because when we have make the correct diagnosis we have the right response you see sin is the problem and jesus christ is the answer I know that sounds so simplistic, but as we know as Christians, that's not so simplistic. Salvation, that sounds simplistic, but also even that. So salvation and sanctification, though it might sound, it's all Jesus, sounds simplistic, living it out isn't. But that's the correct diagnosis. Do not blame your past for your own sin behavior. Jesus Christ, sin is the problem, Jesus Christ is the answer. Third beginning with theological anthropology that we're also all fallen it affirms repentance this is talking about rejecting not only the sinful acts but also these sinful desires see a lot of times we get conf confused and and we're like well what about same such attractions well here's something that's important some of you might have heard something like this before call bible things by what call bible things by bible names let's all say that call bible things by bible names campbell said that amen call bible things uh, this is a what what school is this I, i'm a little surprised I, I mean i might say that in other schools but unless i okay it's, it's before lunch so pizza that'll wake you up so call bible things by uh, uh, the staff will know this by bible names the term attraction is not found anywhere in the pages of scripture. Do you guys know that? What does the Bible say instead? Desire and temptation. Desire and temptation. The Bible does not confuse these two categories. Being tempted is not sin. For those in this room that are struggling with temptations and you're beating yourself up, be encouraged. You're human. Amen? Be encouraged. You're just like everyone else but that does not mean to celebrate those temptations and give in to those temptations that then can turn into sinful behavior so that's important it's, and, and as such we need to know that we need to the, the desires the temptations that turn into desires that turn to actions we need to repent of the desires the temptations aren't sin and that's important 
because then that helps us to know none of us should input our identity in our sin struggle. If you struggle with pornography, don't put on Facebook, hi, I'm a porn-watching Christian. No, don't do that. I'm a gossiping Christian. I'm a lustful Christian. I'm a, no, I am a Christian. I'm not a gay Christian. I'm not an ex-gay Christian. I am a Christian. Amen? Lastly, and I'll just finish with this, beginning with theological anthropology answers the born gay question. Aren't people born gay? Isn't this, God, didn't God make them this way? No, we're created in the image of God, but we're also all fallen, not by choice. You can't pray away your sin nature. You can't pray away gay either. You don't pray, I mean, you, praying doesn't pray away things. That's a genie in the bottle concept of God. Are people born gay? Is this the way they are? The Bible doesn't address this, people will say. So we're born with a sin nature. That doesn't mean that we are born gay. We're born with a pre propensity. But we aren't born. None of us, you're not born an alcoholic. You're not born a whatever. You're not born a porn watcher. You're not born a luster. We're born with a sin nature. But even though people wrongly think that people are born gay, Jesus actually gives an answer for that. That even though people wrongly think that people are born gay, Jesus says, you must be born again. You may think you're born an alcoholic. You must be born again. You may think you're born a liar, a cheater. You fill in the blank. You must be born again. The old is gone. The new has come in Christ. You're a new, new creation. That is not a message just for the gay community. That is a message for the whole world. You must be born again. You know, I know many of you probably haven't heard a story like mine before. They're out there, a guy who used to identify as gay and now no longer do. That's an important aspect of my testimony. But actually, that's not how I best summarize it. This is how I summarize it. I once was blind, and now I see. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once did not believe, and now I believe in the Son of God, and his name is Jesus. That is my testimony. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, uh, Lord, we are going to be talking about sexuality this whole week, but honestly, if we do not lift up the name of Jesus, we are saying nothing. Help us, Lord, to love you more than life. For it's the matchless, mighty name of Jesus we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Do not forget this evening, be at Hunter Welcome Center at 5.30. Go get some pizza.